this and the town's also working with the Stanton Foundation. It's a, um, they provided also design money and the Stanton Foundation will also provide up to $250,000 for construction, so specifically for dog parks. Uh, they do many things for canine health, but one is dog parks. So we're relying on that, um, that source of funding for design and construction. Uh, we're applying in the summer for that you know, construction money. So right now it's a site plan review application. As Greg noted, it is a special permit application as well because the shed and the fence will be in the front setback. And we do have a survey plan now and the dog park won't change much, but it, the, the front setback, the fence, the sidewalk, um, will all be within the front setback. So a five foot high fence, you know, will be, um, you know, within the 20 feet and the shed will be, you know, pushed back so it's not in the right of way, but it will be within the 20 feet. Um, you know, there's two sections to the park. It's been determined there's a large dog section and a small dog section. So the large dog section is for dogs over 30 pounds and then the small dog, dogs less than 30. Um, you know, there's a looped walkway that'll be accessible in both sections, um, a shade sale for both to provide shade, uh, benches, dog watering station, a trash receptacle, and then a dog, uh, doggy bag waste uh, receptacle as well. Because this is over the capped part of the landfill, uh, there can't be any tree plantings. So, you know, there's the shade sale and there's adjacent trees to the south that could provide afternoon shade. Um, the large dog section and some perimeter trees, existing perimeter trees um, to the north for the small dog section. Um, you know, there's also uh, planned irrigation if possible. The irrigation lines would be brought in um, in the fill. So nothing can penetrate the existing cap. So, you know, even the fence, nothing is gonna go beyond the cap. So all, there'll be fill brought up. There's, you know, we requested 6,700 cubic yards, right? Yeah, yeah. Total. total. So that'll be the maximum amount. We're hoping to use less, but you know there will be anywhere from a foot to almost five feet of fill in certain sections of the park to make the pathway accessible and to build up enough fill so there isn't any, any risk of having the cap penetrated by the fencing, the footings, or the shade structure footings, or dogs digging. <clears throat> the plans over here, um, I think it's in your packet. Um, as you enter, you know there's 22 parking spaces, two handicap spaces, 20 spaces, um, two bike loops, there'll be an entry kiosk with rules and regulations, contact information. So the dog park task force is, may transition into a friends of the dog park and they'll have um, you know, daily maintenance and weekly maintenance as will public works and conservation staff. But they're hoping to have you know, contact information in terms of who to contact if there's an emergency, you know, if it's after hours, what happens, um, just to make sure it's very clear to the users you know, what they can do. Um, you know, they're working on the rules and regulations now to keep both dogs and people safe. Um, you know, within the loop walkways, there's a pea stone area. So there's grass and then there's pea stone. And so the Stanton Foundation really likes the idea of using pea stone in a dog park. So it's not angular, it's, it's washed or, you know, rounded. Um, you know, it's good for drainage if the dog goes to the bathroom in there. So, it, you know, there's a hose spigot with a watering station, so it could be you know, washed down periodically, and it can also be swept off the pathways. But, you know, in terms of maintenance, it's supposed to be a, a nice material, so, you know, it doesn't need to be seeded or anything. Uh, and if, you know, periodically you may need to add some more. The grassed areas, um, you know, there could be some irrigation, as we said, uh, along the fence, so perimeter irrigation line. And keeping the grass growing is a concern, so there is the ability to cordon off areas if need be, or to try to keep up seeding in the spring and fall. So there is the awareness that dogs can trample grass and it's something that you know, will be maintained. Um, I don't know, Mike Luce here, if he has anything else he'd like to add? Um, yep, I guess I missed the beginning, sorry. Um, if there's some, I, I have some information if you want it about um, uh, traffic you'd like me to present that. I also have a little handout um, that I can submit to staff. Um, but basically, one of the questions that came up was, you know, kind of like how much traffic is this going to generate? And it, it's very hard to say because it's a very small park. When we look at the ITE um, trip generation uh, data, there's really, and the closest use is a regional park. 
And with that use in the manual, there's only one study. <laughs> so it's not a lot of data, but if you take that data um, and try to apply it to a park of this size, the regional park is usually something in, in 40 plus acres. So we're only talking about less than a, an acre and a half. Um, so our engineer prepared um, this summary, which summarizes weekday average daily traffic, weekday AM peak traffic, that's over the course of the peak hour, one hour, PM peak, uh, Saturday average daily trips, and then Saturday peak hour. And during those peak times, there's, um, according to, if you use the figures from ITE, there's literally zero trips in that hour stretch of the peak for weekday and Saturday. On the weekday total average daily traffic, the trips uh, for the park come out to be six. Three entering, three exiting, 50-50. On the Saturday um, total average daily traffic, the uh, total number of trips comes out to eight trips. Um, so we, we have to use caution obviously when we're looking at these figures because there was only one study. But you can get a sense of the level or the amount of traffic this type of use might generate. And it's, it's not much for a small park such as this. Um, I, so my engineer basically said, well, based on you know what we have here with this data, you can safely say that um, you know, it won't have an impact on the level of surface service of surrounding roads. We know there's a subdivision close by, so people are gonna be commuting in and out of there, but again, those, you know, we have the peak, peak hours when that traffic is at its heaviest, but at the same time, these numbers say that at, at those peak times, there's zero trips to the park. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's kind of offset. Um, so take it as you will, but this is what we're, you know, our engineers are trained to, um, you know, analyze these numbers from ITE, um, and again, we're applying the closest use that we could find in the manual to this particular use. Someday they will probably actually have dog parks in the manual. Right now they don't. Uh, so I will, well, we'll leave a copy here. Sure. Nate, did, I, did I email this to you? I'm going to stop. All right, I'll talk to you and we can hand over to the staff. Um, there was a, I guess we had a site walk through the day, I didn't know if you touched on that. I think Nate seemed to have covered most of the issues. Um, the amount of fill, again, we might adjust that, but it's not gonna change the accessibility of the walkways or anything. We're just trying to, hopefully trying to lower the, the finished grade a little bit in the lower section of the park to, it's just to reduce the, the amount of money that's going to be needed uh, for a contractor to bring in fill and or if the town was to be able to donate fill so that there wouldn't be such a high quantity and it would be a little bit easier to deal with. Uh, but again, we're pretty confident that it won't change um, um, the general character of the park. As you saw, it was a pole shaped and we're going to level out that middle section. Again, the fill is up to about <coughs> um, in you know in that um, lowest stretch of the bowl. Uh, if we can get it even to three and a half to four feet, you know we'll, we'll be saving some money. To trying to do our best. Um, then uh, Nate mentioned the property line. We've been trying to get that. We finally got a plot of it. Um, I do have a copy, but it's digital. If you wanted to see it, but um, in the existing conditions, that sidewalk. The existing sidewalk um, basically straddles the, pro the street line, the property line. When you get down to where the shed is, the, the property line actually swings around over here, and then it kind of takes this weird bend and then continues. The shed is actually, uh, I think it was within the street right away, so we can push the shed back so it's you know on the parcel of the dog park, and also just um, angle off that corner of the fence, I believe the property line is right across that corner, so the fence will be fully out of the street right away. Right, so the right of way, I mean, it, I don't know if it's like 60 feet wide, it widens to a very... It's varying width, apparently, right. yeah. Chris? I just wanted to point out that you do have maps on your table that show the property line oh, okay. and the... Um, 
the way the existing uh, plan and the proposed plan interact with that property line. So um, that gives you the information that Mr. Liu was just talking about. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so I'd say that, you know, the, um, staff also brought this to the Conservation Commission Design Review Board and the Disability Access Advisory Committee. And so the Conservation Commission has approved it. You know, they recommended having a vegetated swale, kind of a step swale with weirs on the south, um, southeast side to capture any runoffs. So that's something that's been incorporated. The Design Review Board, um, you know, didn't have too many comments. They liked some of the, the precedent images of what may be used in terms of the furniture and shade sails. Um, you know, there were some questions about what exactly the entry kiosk would look like. It, right now, it's the idea that it may be like a, a an X kind of you know multi-sided kiosk that could have you know few display so, uh, faces on it. Um, and the Disability Access Advisory Committee, you know, asked that the gates be um, self-closing and you know that the latches be accessible. So that's something that you know will happen just to make sure we we can accommodate different users. Um, and the Conservation Commission, yeah, they didn't have any other questions. You know, the, the town is working with natural heritage because there is the endangered grasshopper sparrow that nests further up on the landfill. So that's something that will still be worked out as the dog park uh, is developed. And uh, the town is also working with uh, DEP and state agencies and tie and bond to do any methane and CO2 monitoring, both on the landfill and on this part of the dog park. So that's something that would continue after construction and so if you know there any needed to be anything addressed it would be but at this time there's no no concern or any you know they've been notified of this project as well all right is that everything i think so have any questions or yeah we'll get to the questions in just a minute uh, so we did have a site visit yesterday and all of us were there so I think we're all acquainted with that. And I can't think of any information that was shared that hasn't been discussed. But if anyone present can, feel free. All right. Uh, so now is time for board questions. I suppose one question I did have about the traffic. You mentioned that the closest category to this was a regional park. Is there a category? And this is a question for the applicant as well as perhaps for anyone on our board that may be familiar with these things. Um, a category, perhaps you know, playground, anything smaller than a, a regional park that might be uh, relevant here? I think there's other types of park that specifically list elements that are included in a park, such as playgrounds or splash pads and that type of thing. And obviously, you can't use this or, or equate this with that type of park with those kind of activity uh, centers. So um, I suppose, for instance, yeah. um, and I don't know if you worked on the Groff Park project, but what category uh, was that put under for the purposes of traffic calculations? Actually, I don't think we did any traffic generation for that specific project. Yeah, we consider Groff Park was already pretty widely used, so we didn't consider that as, you know, the addition of a spray pad would increase the traffic enough to have a, a change of a traffic, you know. It, was, it wasn't a change of use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think for, you know, for the dog park, you know, we're planning on 20 spaces. You know, some of it is just anecdotal, how, looking at how many cars go to Amethyst Brook and Wentworth and other areas and how many, you know, could be dog walkers. So I think the design is conservative in the respect that it, you know, has bike loops, enough parking, and you know it has sidewalks so it can accommodate the neighborhood. The idea is that, I, you know, I'm not sure how accurate the, the trip generation modeling is. I think there could be you know, a lot more users than they're estimating. I mean, there could be certainly times when you know, there's Zero. Zero. a number of people. I mean, I mean based, on, you know, based on what the rate is in the ITE manual, it comes out to zero based on this size of the park or basically 0.1 or 0.2. You can't count a fraction of a trip. It's either a trip or not a trip. Um, so that's why it's zero, because it came out so low, under one. Um, what was I going to say? Well, oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm sure there might be times when, when you know this park is heavily used, and there might be times when nobody's visiting the park for hours at a time. So given, you know, it, it kind of balances out. And, Given that we're on a very well maintained and you know tra highly traveled road being Route Nine that can easily handle you know uh, traffic getting on the road and getting off, it doesn't, we can't anticipate that it's going to be a problem. All right, thank you. Other comments, questions, Maria? 
Um, we got an email about the shed being in the property line, and you said it was going to slide southeast, and then is it also going to slide outside of the 100-foot wetland buffer? So that, that yeah, so um, that buffer actually applies to there's a, a pond across the street. Yeah. And so we're actually going to be pulling it a, further away from that wetland. You know, so the, we're already within the 100 feet. We're going to be pulling it closer to the, you know, 100 foot. So I've spoken with the town's wetland administrator, and she didn't see a problem with that you know, because it's we'll actually bringing it further away from the wetland by moving it out of the right of way. there are some questions at the site visit about maintenance so the DPW is going to maintain the site could you speak a little bit about the maintenance plan sure yeah there's one that was submitted so you know the dog park task force you know will probably transition to a friends group and they'll you know try to take over some of the daily um, routine maintenance you know whether it's emptying waste baskets making sure the park's clean the hope is that it also be self-policing so that the you know owners will be responsible um, and then Public Works will also, you know, help with weekly trash removal, mowing, and, you know, any larger kind of maintenance tasks. Um, but, you know, the, the friends group would have, you know, a key to the shed for manual tools to sweep up, you know, the P-stone back onto the area if it need be or keep the walkways, surfaces clean. Um, and then, you know, in the winter, the town would flush the irrigation system and the park is open, you know, during daylight hours. It wouldn't be open during the winter, so the town would close it down, remove the shade sails, and do that seasonal type of, of maintenance. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. I think some of it is also dependent on the use. So right now, you know, we're anticipating that the friends group can do some things, and DPW, and if it's, you know, if we, you know, if we need need be the conservation staff, the land manager could also help out if it, you know, if there's really busy times, and the animal control officer as well. Mm -hmm. Does the uh, organization, I think the Stanton group that you mentioned, um, provide kind of best practices for sanitation and uh, facilities like these? They, well, their recommendations are incorporated into the design with the water and having water available to rinse down the gravel, to even rinse, um, you know, spot water, grass areas. Uh, but we're hoping that we can obviously get the irrigation system included in this design. They have other uh, site design specific um, guidelines, you know, for instance, like they want the gravel to be a little bit lower than the walkway. So, it, you know, it doesn't, it's a little harder to have it kicked up onto the walkway. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we realize that's going to happen. And, and with, with uh, you know, dog owners, we know that, you know, people really care about their dogs and they're going to care about the facility. So it's, it's not, probably not going to be an issue to have uh, friends of the dog, dog park, you know, do uh, routine maintenance like sweep gravel off the um, walks that happen and that type of thing. So, right. And I think the proposed rules and regulations also address, you know, Stanton Foundation has, you know, recommendations in terms of how many dogs per owner and, you know, that they want them to be unleashed once they're in the dog park area so dogs won't be leashed at all. You know, they have, um, you know, under voice control, you know, don't bring treats in or glass bottles. You know, humans can't bring food in. So, you know, some of those rules are. Um, based on best practices and the standard foundation recommendations. Mm -hmm. Great. David? And who would enforce those rules? Well, the idea would be that it would just be self-policing. And so, you know, like I said, on the entry kiosk, there, the idea is that there'd be a, you know, a series of phone numbers or contacts. So it could be the animal control officer. It could be, you know, staff. It could be someone who is willing to volunteer if they have the availability to come and, you know, monitor. But really it would just be a self-policing and if need be there'd be numbers who could be people could be contacted Christine so you said daylight hours which I assume is like sunrise to sunset and it would have signs posting that is it um, I don't want to say self-policing because no one should be there but is it locked up or is the police department gonna like a, like any other park we right. have it's usually those hours yeah, I'm, ass I'm assuming it will be locked, um, so there'll be, you know, a key or something that could be used to control the access. And that could be both town staff or the friends group could come in, open, and lock it. Yeah, so I, um, there's only one entry gate, you know, to be able to get into the park, so that could easily be, easily be locked at the end of the day. Um, the maintenance, there's also a maintenance gate to get in the mower, but that would be locked.
Could you hear me on that? Oh, we can hear well, you. I can't sorry. Hear you. Would you like me to repeat? Okay. Next. Do you have a follow-up question? Perfect. One short one on. Um, so you said seasonally it would be closed, and will that be determined by the organization that's running it or the town on when it like would close for the season and does it reopen and then does right. it reclose because of snow? Like how does that work? Right, I think it'd be a conversation with both organizations. You know, the idea would be in, during heavy snow, it's not going to be um, plowed or snow is not going to be cleared. So, um, you know, it may be that if, you know, in some winters we don't have snow until January and it's mild weather, then maybe it would stay open later. It's kind of dependent on the weather. Um, but, you know, we're not going to go out there and shovel the pathways or anything. So once there's a winter's established, it will be closed. Last one, because it's sunrise to sunset, whether summer or winter, so there's no lighting at this place, at, or on the kiosks, nothing solar, there's no lighting. Right, there's no lighting provided in the plan. Um, I, I can't remember if there's any street lights there, but obviously they're, they're not gonna light the park, you know? So um, it would be unlikely that somebody would be wandering around in the middle of the night out here, or at dark. All right, thank you. Further questions from the board? Turn to questions, comments from the public. We have no public with us tonight. So we turn back, applicant's response, anything you'd like to add? No, I mean, I think the town, you know, like I said, a lot of people are excited for this and the idea might be that there could be, you know, more in the future, but this is the first one and we're excited to get it going. Chris? Um, I wonder if Mr. Malloy would talk about the trees that are along the uh, roadway and what's going to happen to them and about the new trees that are going to be planted, or maybe Mr. Liu could talk about that. Sure. There's, I think, about five existing trees planted along the roadway. Uh, one's in decline. The, the rest are in pretty good health. The town tree warden, Alan Snow, thought maybe two or three could be transplanted. So that is, you know, part of the plan is to move those trees and relocate them. Uh, and then possibly plant, you know, two new trees next to the parking area. So on either end of the parking, you know, the pole and parking, there'll be trees planted within the right of way. You know, they're outside the property and outside the cap. Um, and that would be the only plantings as part of this project. All right, thanks again. So at this point, we would normally hear final comments and questions from the public, the applicant, and the board. As I mentioned earlier, we don't have a, a quorum sufficient to vote on this site plan review application or a special permit at the moment, but we hope to uh, next Wednesday. So unless there's any further discussion from, yes, Chris. I wondered if you would like to talk about um, conditions, possible conditions, so that you'd have them in hand for next Wednesday if you continue this meeting. And one of them would be the kiosk. Um, there aren't any details about the kiosk, and it would probably be a good idea for you to have a condition that says that the kiosk is going to come back to you for review and approval at a future date since there isn't any information now. I'm just concerned that the building commissioner may view that as a separate item for some reason and cause a new site plan review application to come to you. And I think it makes more sense to handle it as a condition. Uh, yes, I absolutely agree with that. The two conditions that I had in mind, and we're, we can certainly address those now, would be the one that was just mentioned to have the kiosk plan subject to um, future approval by the planning board and also that the shed is to be relocated as discussed to be contained entirely within the parcel. Mm -hmm. Any other conditions that board members would like to include? David? Do we need a condition of that for the fire department's access or ambulance access to the park? Yeah, okay. so we can address that. There is a 10 foot wide gate near the maintenance shed and then there's also a 10 foot wide gate in the fence separating the two dog areas. So there, you know, I guess during the fire department review, they didn't notice that, but there are 10 foot wide gates to allow access into the park in both sections. So they'll be able to get 30, foot, 30 pounds all out. <laughs> I hope so. Excellent. Christine. Just to add on to your um, shed, also that the fence is put yeah. back in the property line. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other conditions board members would like to see? Okay, so we have discussed continuing this public hearing to next Wednesday, the 26th, and I'd entertain a motion to do so. Chris, would 7.05 p.m. be all right? That would be fine. 
I'll make a motion to, um, I guess, do we close? Continue the public continue. hearing. Continue, yeah, till um, next Wednesday, the 26th at 7.05. Second. All right, moved and seconded. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor? That's unanimous. All right, thanks. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. See you next week. All right, so moving on down the agenda, the next item is item 4A, zoning subcommittee report. And most of us were at the zoning subcommittee, so uh, I guess we'll just give a, a brief update. Um, Christine, I think you were the one that wasn't there. Oh, Jack also is not there. Jack, you're going to rejoin us? Yeah. <laughs> so the zoning subcommittee met this afternoon, and it was a joint meeting between the zoning subcommittee and the town council's community resource committee and we discussed with them and the staff member Dave Zomek how uh, planning board and zoning subcommittee town council might uh, look at zoning going forward and we had a productive conversation and I, I think we agreed for the immediate future that we'll continue to hold joint hearings between the zoning subcommittee and the community resources committee. We also looked to uh, some members of the community resource committee that joined us to give us feedback both on the three zoning articles that the zoning subcommittee has recommended, that the planning board recommend to town council, and we also are looking for some feedback from that group on the larger zoning priorities list that the zoning subcommittee has put together. So we look forward to continuing that conversation. We also uh, received some uh, correspondence from students at, I'm failing to recall the school, was it Fort River? Fort River? Students have recommended that uh, we consider adopting a zoning ordinance that in essence would require that developers of any non-agricultural parcels of one and a half acres or more in size must conserve at least 30% of the tree canopy. Um, so this was a uh, different kind of proposal, not something we had really considered before. And the zoning subcommittee is looking for input from the sh public shade tree committee and from the tree warden. We certainly appreciate uh, the students' initiative in reaching out to us, and we're going to see if something along those lines might be uh, feasible. This is an uh, opportunity for public comments about the Zoning Subcommittee report. Again, we don't have any public with us tonight. Are there any other planning and zoning issues? All right, moving on to 5A, Old Business, Planning Board Rules and Regulations, final version. So this is a copy that we have in our packet of the rules and regulations after the changes that we voted in at our last meeting. Chris? So this um, new rules and regulations has been filed with the town clerk and has been posted on the town website, so it's official. Great, thank you. Um, I just wanted to make sure that you all had seen that there is a revised agenda. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. All right, next item is 5B, report to town council on zoning bylaw amendment to bring the bylaw into conformance with Amherst Home Rule Charter delivered to town council on June 13th. This is another item that we voted on at our last meeting and staff prepared a report which has been delivered to town council about our recommendation. The staff did prepare the report and it has been delivered to town council. Thank Great, thank you for that. Is there any additional uh, topic not reasonably anticipated, 48 hours, old business? Excuse me. Yes, David. Do we know when the town council is going to vote on those, the revised? Chris? Um, Bob Ritchie, a former town council, um, and I met with the town council the other night when I meant the first town council, S-E-L, and the second S-C-I-L. Anyway. We met with them on um, Monday night, I guess it was, and um, explained to them what this was all about. Um, and they are, um, they asked a lot of questions, and um, most, th most of their questions were about the process of them adopting a zoning amendment. So t the town clerk and I are working on that with the president of town council to try to smooth out that process. But um, the plan is that town council will uh, hold a public hearing 
and um, hopefully vote on the changes to the bylaw on July 1st. Thank you. All right, the next item is 6A, New Business, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, Representative and Alternate Nomination and Election. So currently that's Christine and Jack, Jack primarily and Christine is the alternate. Um, so Chris, if I understand this is the time of year when PVPC is looking for this action to be taken on our part? No? That is correct. Usually you do it um, after July 1st, but in this case um, there's some urgency because there's an election coming up of the, or a choice to be made about the executive director of the PVPC and um, town council has requested that the planning board have the vote to um, nominate and elect uh, PVPC representatives during this meeting so that they, these representatives can vote in the election which is on the 27th, is that right? 27th? Yes, yes uh, which, so that's next week. So, um, and what we've kind of, um, what should I say, come to understand is that um, the planning board nominates and elects its representative and then the planning board uh, has the ability to nominate an alternative representative, but that representative is appointed by, um, I believe it's the town, town manager. So that's the information that I have. So we're to elect a representative and nominate a alternate. And are our current representatives happy to continue serving in those capacities? I will. Well, <laughs> would anyone like to make a motion? I move that. I'll move that our current representatives remain. Second. All right, moved and seconded. Further discussion? Yes, Chris. Can you do this uh, separately, just so it's completely clear to town council and the town manager what's happening here? So um, I would suggest that you nominate and elect Mr. Jemsick. And then that you nominate um, Ms. Gray Mullen, and I will pass that information along to the town manager. And Ms. Gray Mullen may be able to elaborate on that. So Jack is the commissioner, and then I am the alternate commissioner, if you want to. Commissioner is the term preferred? Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, that's what you uh, I move to nominate Mr. Jemsek as the commissioner to the PVPC from the Amherst Planning Board. Moved and seconded. Further discussion? If not, all in favor? All right, that's unanimous. I move to nominate Ms. Gray Mullen as the alternate commissioner. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor? Also unanimous. Thank you both for your continuing service. I understand that um, one of our colleagues in Northampton has been nominated for the head role at the PVPC, Wayne Fiden. That's correct, and I think um, if you wanted to find out more information about that, I believe that I could forward to you um, information about the other candidate as well as Mr. Fiden. Would you like that information? We have it. <laughs> if, as long as our representatives have the information, I'm satisfied. <laughs> Thank you. All right, anything else on PVPC? We will have the report oh. later. Yeah. Oh, we will. Yeah. This was specifically on the election. Uh, item 6B, summer meeting schedule. Chris? I had reached out to you about some alternative date, dates, and I think those dates were the 10th of July, um, the 24th of July, the 14th of August, and I think Think, and maybe the 31st of July. And I do not have my sheet here to um, tell me who said they could attend on those dates. So I don't know if you remember what you said about those dates, but I can send out another email um, as necessary. We have two upcoming public hearings that we have to take care of, uh, actually three. One is Amherst Media that is continuing, and um, I need to find out from town from our town attorney about Mr. Stutzman's status with regard to that public hearing. That's currently scheduled to go ahead on July 17th, but we don't have a quorum for that for July 17th. Um, so we have to work on that. 
and um, the other couple of, well, I'll get to the others as when we get to that part of the uh, agenda. But in any event, I will send out another email tomorrow about the schedule, and you'll have a chance to look at your schedules and get back to me about these alternative dates. Okay. Christine? Could it be a doodle poll? It could be a doodle poll. Um, yes, it could be a doodle poll. And for the next two weeks, we've just decided we will hold a meeting next Wednesday, the 26th. And I believe we will not hold a meeting on July 3rd because there are no public hearings. That's correct. All right, thank you. Um, there's the question of whether the zoning subcommittee should meet next week. And before we make a determination on that, it was mentioned at the zoning subcommittee that there are several uh, planning board meetings or planning board related meetings next week, starting with on Monday at the Bang Center, the uh, open hearing of the residents related to the affordable housing proposal on Northampton Road. That's at 6.30 p.m. And on Tuesday at 6.30 or 7, Chris? 7, 7 p.m.? 7 p.m. on Tuesday is the flood mapping. The flood mapping, joint hearing with the Conservation Commission. We have our meeting just discussed on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, I'm forgetting the final one. This is Kendrick Thursday Park. Thursday is Kendrick Park Playground. So knowing that all Seven. those meetings are there, should the zoning subcommittee meet on Wednesday? No. No. The zoning <laughs> subcommittee will not meet next Wednesday. All right. Uh, are, are there any new business topics not reasonably anticipated? Um, Jack? Uh, clarification. What's the Thursday meeting? The Thursday Next meeting week? is, a, I believe, an informational meeting about a proposed playground at uh, Kendrick Park. The town's applied for some funds for that project. Chris? Um, we're applying for a park grant for um, a playground on Kendrick Park. There is a playground already designated in the plan of Kendrick Park, and there's an opportunity to um, get up to, I think it's up to $400,000 from uh, the state to help us with that um, endeavor. And uh, the idea is that we're going to follow the plan that we already have for Kendrick Park and fit the playground into the designated area. Um, this particular meeting is an effort to um, do outreach to the community because that's part of the um, park grant application process. We have to show that we have reached out to the community. So it's really, you know, people who might actually use the playground who we're hoping will come. You all are certainly welcome to come if you like to or if you have an interest in this project, but don't feel obligated to come. Thank you. Are there any other? Yes, Christine? Only remind, Jack and I will be at PVPC. <laughs> if you were thinking you were free. David? Go, back to the, um, are there plans or, or project description of the, uh, for the housing project that's proposed on Northampton Road? It's the subject of the meeting this coming Monday. I haven't been able to find it on the town website. Do you know? So there's a lot of information available. Valley CDC, I believe, has some on their website. And one of the issues here is that the hearings topic is the CPA funding for this proposal. So the plans do have a fair amount of detail to them, but they're not the level of detail that we would see if the project proceeds to a ZBA uh, 40B permit hearing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, any other new business topics not anticipated? Any Form A A and R subdivision applications? No Form A's. Upcoming ZBA applications? Um, let's see. We have one upcoming ZBA application. It is by a, a company called Tip Up LLC, and it's a request for a special permit to allow a non owner occupied duplex on at 119 North Whitney Street. I think they're going to be adding a unit there. So there's an existing single family home? That's what I understand, yes. Hmm. All right. Is that the only upcoming ZBA application? I believe that is the only upcoming ZBA application. All right. Upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications? Chris? So we. We do have um, Amir's project has been submitted, and so that will be put on an, an upcoming agenda. Um, you'll remember Amir McChee came to you and described a project on Southeast Street that he's proposing right behind the Florence Savings Bank, and it's going to be 66 apartments and I believe 68 
parking spaces with um, some retail space down below. And um, so that will be coming to you. Another one is a, kind of a smaller project. It's the Bank of America um, across the street from the Florence Savings Bank in that same village center. And they're putting in some more lighting because they feel that there's a need for more security there. And so that will be coming to you as well. Um, and of course, Amherst Media will be coming back to you at some point. I'm not exactly sure if they're going to be ready for the 17th. And uh, anyway, we can't hold them hearing that night because there are only four of you available. So you'll have to work on a different night for the Amherst Media. Has there been any update on the status of the tree hearing related to that Southeast Street project you mentioned, Chris? I've been. Um, trying to get some information from the town manager about how he wants to go on that, but he's been um, otherwise occupied with a lot of things having to do with town council, so I'm hoping that we will get an answer for that before, um, before you have to delve into this project, but if, if we don't, you know, you can just put a condition on that says that removal of the trees has to be approved by the appropriate entity. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Sorry, Jack, did you have a comment? Uh, Great. Okay. Um, Planning Board Committee and Liaison Reports, PVPC. Oh, uh, yeah, so we had the annual meeting uh, last, was it Thursday? Yes. Yeah, so, and um, uh, Kimmel presented uh, an, uh, quite a bit on energy uh, and, uh, you know, green energy <laughs> and where we're going and uh, with that, very informative, I, I can't really get into that uh, too much, but, uh, and then they elected the executive uh, committee for the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission amongst the current commissioners. And I just, I just wanted to note that uh, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, ongoing uh, uh, commissioners there that have been there a long time. And, and, and so the incumbency is, is a, is a re, uh, recurring theme there, it seems to me, within the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. But I just want to note that there was one person I think had five years uh, on the committee, but the rest of them were basically 10 to 20 years serving on their respective planning boards in the planning, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. They've been with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission for 10 to 20 years, uh, the folks on the executive uh, committee, and that numbered like seven people. So experience matters. I just wanted to, uh, to note that. And, and then uh, Tim Brennan, with, you know, phenomenal run as the executive director, and he had a, quite a send off. And his staff stepped up, uh, and you don't realize, you know, the, the quality of, of people that are working there. And that's, I think, uh, makes, you know, it's just a very well run organization. So, uh, but it was a very good thing to attend. Great, thank you. CPAC, our representative is not here. Same with Ag Commission, Design Review Board. Uh, the Affordable Housing Trust met and we discussed a number of things, still working on revising the town's housing policy, which the trust is gonna be sending out to the planning board and to the town council for its uh, adoption, for their adoption. And so we should be seeing that shortly. And then we also spent a, a large amount of time discussing that affordable housing project on Northampton Road, which we discussed in which Planning board members would be welcome to attend the meeting on Monday. Uh, concerning it, the trust did uh, vote to send a letter to town council uh, expressing some concerns about the way that the process has been conducted. So as I mentioned, uh, the current hearing and the sta status of the project is that they're awaiting approval from town council for the CPA money that was recommended by CPA by the trust. Um, that's $500,000, which is to be bonded. And so essentially it's the funding that's at question now. And but the conversation has really extended out into the minutia of the project. And so you know, there's a lot of questions being asked, which are good questions, um, you know, about exactly how the project is gonna be run, whether there's gonna be on-site staff, the makeup of the residents. But these are questions that would come up during the ZBA uh, comprehensive permit process. So the concern that the trust expressed and that I share is that it, you know, town council is determining its processes, how it goes about things. And if we set a precedent where CPA funding is scrutinized to this level with every CPA project, it could be a huge impediment for affordable housing projects and anything that CPA funds. So 
Bless you. I would encourage uh, any planning board members uh, that are interested to learn more or that have an opinion to attend. It's likely going to be a very well attended uh, hearing on Monday. Chris? I believe there will be a fair amount of information on the town council's website. Um, they're going to receive a packet about this project, including a memo from the planning department, a timeline for the project, information about how um, tenants are selected, and a general overview of the project. So. Um, I believe that's going to be included in the town council packet, and you would have access to that. And most of this information is also available on the Amherst, what do they call it, Amherst Housing, Affordable Housing Trust website. They don't put municipal in there. I would it's think Amherst that it is, but I'm just looking housing. to Nate to confirm that. Is that information there? Most of it is Nate's there. our staff person? Okay. All right. Um, zoning subcommittee, we already spoke of. Downtown parking working group. I uh, just want to report that uh, the consultant, Ken Nelson Nygaard, continues to work on the draft report for parking. Uh, the second parking forum was scheduled for next Wednesday, um, but due to some scheduling conflicts on the town side, it's going, it's been canceled and it will be, um, it's postponed to an un, to be determined date, but it will be happening. And I'll update you later. What is the uh, scope of the second hearing? So the first one um, was more talking about areas of issue that will be looked at, and then this time when they come back, they're actually going to make suggestions of how they're working on in the report, how they're going to suggest to make the key issues um, better. All right, thanks. Okay, next item, report of the chair. I have no report other than that um, it's not even 8 o'clock yet, so did pretty well tonight. Mm -hmm. Report of staff. I would say there's a lot going on. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps an understatement. All right, thanks everyone. We're adjourned.